Okay guys, today we're going to be taking a look at bushcrafting knives and understanding the purposes, the tasks, and the design of most bushcrafting knives. And the intent of this video is to primarily help some of the newer bushcrafters or people new to bushcrafting uh, to help them understand basic terminology and when people speak about knives being able to do certain tasks, uh, this is what they mean, or if they have certain features, this is what they mean. So. As always, with all videos, please don't forget to comment, like, share, subscribe, and ring that notification bell. That really helps me know that you guys like what I'm putting out and that you guys want to be a part of the project. So without any further ado, let's jump right into it. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about with bushcrafting knives, and before we jump into the design and kind of uh, different design features and the design of bushcrafting knives as a thing or as a rule, uh, we're going to talk about some of the most common tasks that people talk about when it comes to bushcrafting and even survival knives. So one of the first things that is mentioned widely by myself and by others and something that might be a little bit controversial is batoning. Now batoning, to help you understand what that basic task is, is where you take a knife like such and you use a wooden mallet or a wooden log or a piece of wood to drive a, your knife through another piece of wood. Usually people think of batoning when they think of batoning a piece of wood um, with the grain to split it into smaller pieces to make kindling and to help uh, start fires or keep fires going. And that is certainly one way to baton. Another way to baton is cross grain through wood to help fell trees. So you would usually have your knife at about a 45 degree angle and you would baton it in to a smaller tree to help uh, either and this would help you kind of mimic the abilities of something like a hatchet if you didn't have one or a smaller saw if you didn't have one. Once again, it's no replacement to a proper hatchet or an axe or a saw, but you can use a knife to baton in that way as well. So once again, it's a little bit more controversial of whether you do it or should do it or not, but that is what batoning is. The next thing you'll probably encounter is something called feather sticking and feather sticking is usually in conjunction with batoning down smaller pieces of wood or making kindling and feather sticking is basically where you take a piece of wood a smaller piece of wood and you shave on it to create basically curls made out of wood and the objective of feather sticking is to make a piece of wood easier to catch on fire because you're increasing the surface area or the area of wood that fire uh, can reach and can ignite. So it basically turns something that might be difficult for a fire to catch uh, to make it easier. So once again, usually happens in the kindling process and it can be used as a form of artificial kindling. The next term you might hear is a tri-stick. And essentially what a tri-stick is, or creating a tri-stick, is a small, around wrist thick, thumb thick piece of wood that you carve multiple notches in with your knife. And this is to prove your skill with a knife in creating different notches. It's also to prove the knife's ability to see if that knife can do those different tasks. So those are some of the most basic and readily used uh, tasks and procedures that you will encounter in bushcrafting. And when people talk about a knife either batoning well or not batoning well, that's what they mean. If it, a knife feather sticks well or doesn't feather stick well, that's what it means. So the next part we're going to talk about is knife design and features. So the first feature we're going to talk about is one called jimping. And this is something that came about really with the tactical knife craze of the early 2000s, but essentially what jimping is, and it's going to be a little bit challenging to see from this distance, but it means basically any notch that is cut into the blade or the stock of the steel designed to improve traction. And the reason I give it such a broad definition is that jimping can be found on many different places or parts of a handle. It can be back towards the back of the handle, 
most commonly it's up here where you would naturally rest your thumb but some knives also more hunting oriented knives have jimping towards the tip of the knife to give you traction while skinning so jimping can come in a wide variety of different places but the intent is always the same and that is to give or aid with traction and give the user extra traction so my personal opinion when it comes to jimping is I'm not a very large fan of it because once again it largely came from tactical knives where uh, you would be potentially stabbing or there would be a lot of force applied to that knife and in that sense it makes sense to have jimping but for wilderness knives, bushcraft knives, and even survival knives uh, you're going to be holding your knife for a long duration or extended duration or a longer period of time usually carving notches or carving with your knife and jimping can be very painful or create a hot spot for your thumb or for other fingers that have to deal with that jimping for a prolonged period. So I'm not the largest fan of jimping, however it does have its place in knives such as EDC and tactical knives, but I don't think that it is the best for camp knives, for bushcraft knives, or for survival knives. However, there are different knives. However, there are different knives and different options out there that do come either jimped or non-jimped. Things such as the Bark River Knives Bushcrafter do come in variants that are jimped, and there are variants like this one that are not. Okay, so the next part we're gonna talk about is grinds. Now, I'm gonna try to stay pretty basic with the grinds because there are many different grinds out there, and they all serve their own unique purposes. For most bushcrafting knives, you're gonna hear of Scandinavian or Scandi grinds. And essentially what a Scandi Scandinavian grind refers to is a single bevel or a single angle that goes from the initial start point of the grind down to the very cutting edge. And the reason why bushcrafters like these grinds in particular is because they bite and cut wood very well. They also craft very well or carve very well. And they're also very easy to field maintain because you're only dealing with one angle when it comes time to sharpen one of these in the field. You only have to worry about getting one angle right and uh, that makes it a little bit easier to sharpen, especially if you're using something like a flat stone. You can just lay that edge on the flat stone until that full grind is contacting the stone and then you know you're sharpening it at the correct angle. So they are much easier to field sharpen than a less traditional grind, something like a flat grind or full flat or a hollow grind. That being said, full flat grinds are also another very good wilderness blade or wilderness grind, I should say. And a full flat grind is similar to a flat grind, but it just designates the fact that the grind starts at the very back of the spine and works all the way down to near the edge. And at the very cutting edge, there is a bevel. And so the bevel just means that there is a secondary angle. And that is where the trouble with a different type of grind other than Scandinavian can come is that secondary angle. But like I said, each grind serves its own purpose and it is up to the end user to find which grind works best for them and which one that they want to use in the end. There are plenty of good grinds. Saber grinds are also great, but to each their own. You will just see a lot of Scandinavian grinds such as these uh, in the field. Some negatives to the Scandinavian grind uh, can be the fact, some negatives to the Scandinavian grind can be the fact that because it is just a straight angle without any secondary angle, the edge is weaker and more prone to chipping or breaking, which can happen with edges if they are tempered too hard, but most good steels and most good reputable brands are not going to put out knives that would do that. However, it is a possibility and it has happened in the past. So. Uh, other options do include things like the Bark River Knives Bushcrafter that has a convex Scandi grind and essentially what that means is that it's still a Scandinavian grind, it is still a single angle that is straight to the edge but the, instead of the edge being a complete flat kind of like a triangle almost, this has a little bit of a taper to it and a, a little bit of a convex so the edge has a little bit more end support and is less likely to chip or break or crack. So plenty of options when it comes to grinds. The next part we're going to talk about is what I consider blade designs or 
blade styles. So there are two major blade styles out there in bushcrafting specific knives. You're going to encounter things uh, such as the Puko style and knives such as what I consider, what I will call for this video, the lore style. And the lore style can be anything from a camp lore, bush lore, wood lore, jack lore, uh, any of those types of knives. They all kind of go under the same name, but they, they're what I call the lore style knives. And this is more of an English and UK kind of designed uh, style, whereas the Puko is more Scandinavian. Places such as Finland and uh, Sweden helped really pioneer this uh, design. The biggest differences between these two blades are the fact that the lower style knives tend to be more of a spear point, so this means that the spine of the knife and the edge of the knife converge to meet each other close to the middle of the blade, so the tip is center line or close to center line with the handle, whereas a puko style blade is going to mean that the spine does not go at all, it stays completely flat, it is completely flat, whereas the edge does all the work and the edge sweeps up to meet the spine. So the spine is completely flat, but you have a constant kind of sweeping motion in your edge. So once again, this is going to be another personal preference for what you like. Many different companies make uh, different styles. I know Spyderco makes both, or at one time made the Bush the Spyderco Bushcraft, which is more of a lore styled knife and they also made the Puko styled bushcrafting knife as well. So, uh, you know, different companies make different styles and some make both. Uh, the Puko does tend to be a little bit more popular, at least at the time that I'm making this, with companies such as Benchmade making different Puko styled blades and many other different companies doing the same. However, both designs have been around for a long time and both are popular and useful in their own rights. Um, for me, I don't have a super huge preference. I like, there are a handful of Puko knives that I like a lot, such as this LT Wright Legome. And there are knives like the Battle Horse Knives of Battle Lore and Adventure Sworn knives that are of the lore uh, style. And in addition, there are also modified versions of the lore style knife, such as this Bark River Knives Bushcrafter, which this is personally my favorite bushcrafting knife. And this one's a little bit different from both because the lore style knife is more of a spear point, whereas this Bushcrafter is more of a drop point. So it has a reasonably flat back and then suddenly tapers uh, drastically to meet the edge. So this is a little bit of a different style, um, kind of in its own right, and like I said, this is more of a technical drop point, whereas a lore is more of a spear point. So, like I said, the major design styles you'll see will be Pukos and, uh, Pukos and lores. Both are good in their own rights, you just have to find which style works best for you, and what your needs ultimately consist of. In all honesty, Really, either style works just fine. Okay, so the last thing we're gonna talk about is steel considerations. Now, once again, similar to design and style, steel is going to be what fits your needs best. The three easiest ways to break down steel are going to be in high carbon, stainless, and super. And essentially, your high carbon is going to be reasonably cost-effective most times. Um, there are more expensive uh, carbon steel knives, such as tool steels, but by and large, when you get a carbon steel knife, it's going to be reasonably cost effective, it's going to have good edge retention, it's going to be at least reasonably easy to sharpen in the field, if not easy to sharpen in the field, but the biggest drawback is, of course, that it will not be very rust resistant. As you can probably tell with my Legome here, I did actually blue the blade, so I don't have to worry as much about rust, but this knife would be being that it's made of 01 tool steel, which is a high carbon steel, would be very prone to rust. So that is a consideration to keep in mind when you think about what type of steel you would like. There are other options out there, such as stainless steels. And this one is just so happens to be a Gerber strong arm. And this one's in 420 HC, but stainless steels by and large are going to be 
a little bit more expensive, not too expensive, but by and large a little bit more expensive. They will be obviously more rust resistant. However, they will usually have less edge retention and they will also not be able to strike uh, things such as flint or ferro rods as well. Um, but usually stainless steels are pretty good and if you are in a situation where you are encountering a high degree of moisture and you need that extra resistance against uh, rusting, a stainless steel can be a pretty good way to go. Um, last one would be super steels and I kind of put super steels in their leak by themselves because super steels are one you kind of have to research independently because there are some super steels that are very rust resistant and have lower edge retention and there are some super steels that have you know, uh, phenomenal edge retention but they do have lesser corrosion resistance but by and large super steels will be some degree of everything or some degree of all the pros with some degree of all the cons. So another one I didn't mention with stainless steels is that usually they are harder to sharpen and super steels such as this 3 PM, CPM 3V is going to be a good mixture of everything. It has really excellent edge retention and really excellent um, so it's really excellent edge retention and is very strong, so it's very shock resistant, but it is also very hard to sharpen, but it can be, but it is also reasonably corrosion resistant as well. So this has a mixture of all the pros and all the cons. You know, this is not a high carbon steel, so it doesn't rust as easily as high carbon steels, but at the same time, it is also very hard to sharpen or can be harder to sharpen. And it also is, like I said, and also another kind of con to super steels is that they are usually more expensive. So usually you're going to be paying a premium just to have a super steel. So they have a little bit of everything to them and they also command a higher price. But by and large, I do like using super steels over just about anything else. My second place would be tool steels if I had a choice because tool steels, once again, have very good edge retention. They can be a little bit more difficult to sharpen than a normal high carbon steel, but they, the added edge retention usually makes up for that. But they are very prone to rusting. Things like A2, O1, and D2 are very prone to rust. So that's kind of an overlook on steel considerations. Once again, I would highly encourage if you want to know more about steels, this is really just a glossary look at them. Uh, I would highly encourage going to places like Blade HQ where they have a very good breakdown of each steel or each of the more common steels and the different properties and they have them kind of broken down into four tiers of rust resistance, edge retention, and several other uh, components and they give you a rank from 1 to 10 in each of those categories and it helps you understand what steel you're getting or what type of uh, what to expect out of the steel you're getting into. I guess that's the best way to put it. So anyways guys, hopefully you've enjoyed this video. Hopefully this helps you kind of understand bushcrafting knives a little bit better. So whenever you're watching my videos or other people on YouTube's videos, you can understand what they mean when they talk about different tasks or procedures they do with a knife or different materials, components, blade styles, and features that they have. So as always guys, God bless and I'm out.